Hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Denise Shakurjan. I'm um, one third of AI Vermont, and uh, it's uh, my personal pleasure to d welcome all of you here today. Um, in a moment, you'll meet Chris, who's another part of this organization, and Mark, I think, is floating around. So Mark was on all morning, so I hope he's taking a break. Uh, I, I just want to say a quick word about AI Vermont. It's a nonprofit. It's actually only seven months old, which is just incredible to me. We put our heads together on that. Um, Chris and I put our heads together on that right when generative AI was hitting the world by storm. Um, both of us come out of Generator, and we're looking around for a next useful project for the state and concluded that artificial intelligence was the way to go. That part wasn't at issue. The question was, what will we concentrate on? We chose, ultimately, uh, education, teachers. There's a deep philosophy around that, and we spent the whole morning working on that. Okay, so that's where we are today. None of this would happen without our sponsors. So uh, the first order of business is for me to be able to thank them. Um, if you could just hold your applause and at the end make it very loud because <laughs> these guys have been good. I'd like to thank, sincerely, Argosy, UVM Office of Research, Vitalearn, BTV Ignite, who act as our fiscal sponsors, Vermont Principals Association, Seven Days, who act as our media sponsor, Vermont Computer Science Teachers Association, Tom and Mary Evslin, the Metz Family Foundation, the Vermont Academy of Scientists and Engineers, and a particular shout out to some human beings, Josiah Raish. <laughs> there he is. Give a big wave. This is our state's first director of artificial intelligence. That's a pretty cool title. I, I tell him he's got the best title around. Um, Representative Monique Priestley. I'm not sure she's here yet. There's uh, horrible traffic out there, I'm hearing. Veronica Newton, thank you, from Generator. And Dan Harvey, I know you're in here someplace. All good things come back round to Dan, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay, um, it's uh, my pleasure now to turn the mic over to you, Chris, and you can introduce Casey. Thank you. Fantastic. Now you can clap. Yeah. <laughs> So about half of you probably weren't here in the morning, and it was a pretty wild, dynamic time. Uh, the teachers got together. We've actually done this complete turnaround. This was all round tables with paper on top and crayons and things. It was crazy, and, uh, but uh, they worked on strategies. They worked on the philosophy of how you work in a world of machine learning uh, as a secondary school teacher, uh, and uh, I thought it was a very successful group, and I had a fantastic fantastic time talking to everybody. So it was, was awesome. Um, we are, AI Vermont is actually going to continue. It's a three-year mission. We're going to be um, following up. With, we're going to be doing annual summits like this. Um, the vote by the teachers, by the way, was this is a pretty nice place to have a summit. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that was kind of the goal there. But we actually are going to have uh, follow up mini summits and remoter, remoter, is that a word? In, in more remote parts of the state uh, to be able to make it so that there were, I, I, I thank all the people who drove from Brattleboro and St. Johnsbury. That was awesome. Uh, but uh, the, for a change, it would be good if the people from Burlington had to drive somewhere. So we're going to be going to different parts of the state. And we're also going to be launching an online community platform. Uh, because it, it's, it's not one and done. You, you can't just have a conference like this and then abandon people because the world, you know, we've talked about it, the, the you know, AI is the fastest uh, rising technology probably in human history. There's been really nothing like this before. And just, you know, a couple of thoughts, you know, I was in 20 years of, of AI, I mean, yeah, 20 years of uh, IT management, and it was like no software rollout I've ever seen. There's there's no software, there's no the user manual. You know, the engineers who make it themselves aren't completely sure how it works, and they certainly have no idea of why it gives the particular answers it does. So it's... 
support is really important, and we're going to be uh, ongoing. We're going to learn from what we did today, and then we're going to be moving forward in support of the teachers, and I think that's very valuable, and it was a super fun day. But now, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote. And our keynote t this morning, I like to describe, uh, <laughs> I like to describe AI Vermont. We take a cautiously optimistic approach to the emergence of artificial intelligence when it comes to education. Uh, one of the tidbits I shared this morning was early research points out that uh, teachers turn out to actually be some of the best people at actually using large language models to get things done because they're used to actually giving instructions in, in the, the hottest new programming language, English. And, and yeah, I, my background's in development, and I was like, but unfortunately, uh, software developers right now are actually struggle more than just about anybody else in using this. So it's an interesting thing. If you're a software developer, you, you think every, you know, it sounds like it should be a, a calculator that uses words, and it's not. It's something very different. So anyway, so that's that. Um, what I'm very excited to do is introduce Casey Mock. Casey Mock leads policy and strategic communications for the Center of Humane Technology, known for producing The Social Dilemma, the Netflix documentary, winner of two Emmys, and is this right, seen by over 100 million people worldwide? We are so thrilled to have you here. Um, let's talk about your background a little bit, though, because you are no stranger to Vermont. Uh, you led the Vermont Economic Progress Council under Governor Phil Scott um, a number of years ago. You spent four years of working in policy at Amazon. You're an attorney. You were a former Peace Corps volunteer in Moldova. Uh, it's a diverse background, <laughs> needless to say. But also, you're an accomplished writer. We hadn't even talked about that. So uh, you've been a finalist for various literary awards. I, 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 I'm so incredibly impressed. But Casey has actually been back in Vermont recently. Um, the, uh, he's been working close with Monique Priestley on legislation. We were a little disappointed in the outcome of that. I, I hear that there are going to be some changes to that. Uh, there are some uh, very valuable work doing there that uh, AI Vermont very much supports. Uh, so we're hoping to see you back in the state again soon. But anyway, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Um, another round of applause for the AI Vermont team, Chris, Denise, and Mark. Um, they're volunteering their time on this, and like that's the sort of volunteerism that makes Vermont just a fantastic place to work and, and live, and I'm just really honored to be a part of this. And thanks, y'all, for, for coming out. And uh, I used to live about a half mile up the road from here and used to run by here every day when this was the Blodgett Oven Factory, and so I'm really impressed with what this space has become, and I was lamenting that I used to not be able to work here. So, um, so as Chris said, I am with the Center for Humane Technology. Our mission is to align technology with humanity's best interests. Uh, quick show of hands, is anyone in the room actively like a, working on machine learning with large language models? Show of hands. All right, a few people, a few people. I can't say whatever I want and get away with it. Um, as Chris said, I am one of the things that I am not is a machine learning scientist. Now, uh, just a disclaimer on that, um, I am talking about some, specifically some challenges, some bad news with this technology today. That's not to say that uh, I nor CHT do not um, embrace the upsides of this technology. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and just for the purposes of this uh, presentation, I'm actually taking a fairly um, purposely dim view of the powers of this technology, but it's because I'm talking about AI and deception today. And the point, the reason that I'm taking a dim view of the power and the potential of this technology in that context is if you believe in the, uh, in the hype and the potential of this technology, the news that I have is actually way worse. Right, so I'm, I'm actually taking like the the by taking a dim view, I'm taking the the best option here. Um, so stick with me on that, um, and um, you know I'll I'll try to keep it as light as possible. Um, so 
we are all technologists mostly, or have a history in technology at, at Center for Humane Technology. So one of our co-founders, Aza Raskin, he splits time with this other project called Earth Species Project, where he's actually using large language models to translate animal communication to human communication. So that's just an illustration that, again, like we are not anti-technology. We are not anti-AI at CHT. And in fact, like we're embracing um, it in ways that, that we think that it can be um, used for good. Um, in addition to uh, some of our other work, we do have a podcast. So uh, your undivided attention, it's available wherever uh, you get your podcasts. If you like what I have to say, I think you'll like the podcast more. Uh, if you don't like what I have to say, I think you'll probably still like the podcast more. <laughs> it's better than I am. Um, and as Chris mentioned, uh, most people know our work from The Social Dilemma. So we actually learned recently in the last couple of months that it is officially the most watched documentary in Netflix history. Um, and so it's, yeah, thank you. And um, show of hands, who has, has ever, have who, people seen it? Yeah, okay. Um, so if we still have some educators in the room who were here earlier, or if you're, um, if you've seen it um, and you're interested, there's, a, there's actually a shorter version, like 40, 45 minutes, that's available license-free um, that's meant for educational settings. And it comes with a discussion guide and lesson plan and things like that. It's available at the Social Dilemma website. So I encourage you to use that in your schools and your communities um, to educate children and um, yourselves. So what the social dilemma was about was the race to the bottom of the brainstone, about how these technologies that these social media companies was designed to optimize for attention, right? Attention harvesting, right? Um, you're not paying for these products, you are the product. And recently we've taken to calling this humanity's first contact with AI because these products are really a curation AI. They're an algorithm that are, that's picking what to show you next. Right? So it's a very primitive form of AI, but it's AI nonetheless. But now we're coming across news articles like this. I'm sure you've seen this one from earlier this year, um, where there was a Zoom call um, that happened after a finance worker got a suspicious email asking him to wire money to an account. He asked to speak to his CFO. Um, they had a Zoom call. Everything seemed okay. There were other employees that he knew uh, personally on this call, and he ended up wiring the money only to find out later that everyone on that call was a deep fake. This, this one people may not have seen. This is from last year, and if you're interested in learning more about this, there's a website called countercloud.io. I uh, encourage you to check it out. Our team has actually uh, done a similar experiment with this. Um, where, and it cost us about $800 to do this, um, but essentially taking a commercially available and, and open source large language models to create not just an individual deep fake, but a deep fake machine. A, a deep fake machine that will not just create one deep fake, but will actually create an interlocking, interweaving ecosystem of deep fakes that actually creates like an alternate reality about a person or a, a set of facts or circumstances. So the way that this one works is that it will scan and scrape the internet like RSS feeds and things like that for stories about a given topic. Let's say the war in Ukraine, war in Gaza, something like that. And you give it, you, you give it a, um, a slant that you want the, the AI to take. And so it will take those articles and it will rewrite them with the slant that you want it to have. Um, it will generate author, fake author bylines, fake author profiles, fake author photos um, to go with those articles. It will even actually generate comment threads um, on the articles that are informed by common conspiracy theory tropes. Um, and then it will create interlocking social media posts um, about those articles. And so, again, this, this takes about 400, 400 bucks original investment to, to produce, and then they, it can run for, I think, about $1,000 a month. So by comparison, the Russian Internet Research Agency that uh, was using Facebook and other social media during the 2016 election, the Department of Justice estimates that they had a, uh, a budget of about $1.25 million a month and a staff of uh, at least 100. And so, again, $400 original investment, and one or two people can do this now for sense of scale. So we are now at second contact. We're at second contact with creation AI, generative AI, large language models, specifically are what I'm going to be talking about today. So 
I'm, uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm the, uh, in charge of policy for CHT, and so I'm thinking about like, how, are we craft, how do we craft laws in order to solve some of these challenges? Those incidents that I mentioned before, the deep fakes and the, the deep fake machine, these are really challenging to write laws around. Like, think about it. Like, how does law enforcement investigate something like this? How do they find the people who, who um, perpetrated the crime in that case? Um, how do you actually craft a law that criminalizes that behavior? Um, there's First Amendment imp implications often when you're producing deep fakes, right? And so what we do at CHT is we actually think about the incentives driving the development of technologies that can be misused, misdeveloped. So the questions that we're going to talk about today are um, what is the what with what is creation AI designed to optimize for? So like with social media, um, it was designed to optimize for attention. What consequences will that optimi optimization have? The clicker doesn't like me. And uh, how has humanity adapted to similar technologies before? So coming back to some news headlines that you may have seen, stories like this, you know, lawyer submits cases that GPT made up. Um, I don't know if anyone tried TurboTax's AI assistant, but it was indeed terrible this year. Um, you know, how do we describe this? You know, any, anyone have a word for this? Sh shout it out. How you describe this behavior? Adjectives? Irresponsible. Irres Negligent. 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 Train wreck. But what about the, for the machine learning people? What, how would you characterize this behavior on the part of the Hallucination. hallucination? That's what I was looking for. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, indeed, this is the term that often gets thrown around. This is uh, an interview with Sundar Pichai, CEO of Google. And here he's claiming that hallucinations are actually a feature in addition to a bug because you're getting creativity out of it. <laughs> and this is interesting to think about because um, I, th I think in part he's correct, right? Like I, you know, I use these tools at work. I use them for first drafts. And you'll see throughout the presentation, I've actually used them for images. And there is some creative value to these things. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's an inevitable consequence of the way these technologies inherently work and are designed, right? So they're, they're predictive based on the data set on which they were trained. So this large language model is trying to pr predict um, what comes after the sky is. And based probabilistically on its training data, the most probable answer is blue. And so that's what it's saying comes next. And so the more complex the query, the more complex the data set, the more likely you're going to get something like a, like a hallucination. Now, there's been some, um, uh, I'd say, developments, like reinforcement learning through human feedback, which I understand basically to be like clicker training for a dog where you're you know, rewarding um, the, the large language model for good answer, bad answer, um, that can tamp down on hallucinations. Um, recently, there's um, a, another development that folks have been excited about where this sort of probabilistic um, response will be supplemented by accessing a um, sort of a roster of, of, of factual um, answers. Um, I have doubts about that. Uh, I tend to take Gary Marcus's view. He has an excellent blog if you're also a skeptic. And if you're not familiar with Gary Marcus, he testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, last year beside Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI. Um, but at the end of the day, fundamentally, these, these technologies are just guessing the next string of tokens right, that follow um, the ones that came before, whether it's words, whether it's pixels in an image, um, or uh, notes in a song, or what have you. Whoops. So um, here we go. So Reed Hoffman said in September, I'd bet you any sum of money you can get the hallucinations down to the line of human expert rate within months. Um, this was the next month. I would, I would take that bet, um, pay off my student loans. Uh, the clock is ticking, uh, Reed. Um, I mean, this is also a hallucination. Um, and what's fascinating about this to me, um, just someone who's like trained in the humanities rather than in science, is this reads as so confident 
right? There is no humility, there is no doubt in this response. And so for me, there's a word, there's a very technical word that comes to mind that I'll come to in a moment. Um, it's not gonna seem technical when I say it. Um, for someone who confidently says something without regard for whether it's true or false. But I wanna come back to um, something like uh, Sundar Pichai's quote from a few minutes ago. So this is from a, a Microsoft executive who says something very similar. So I agree with this, uh, with this first statement. So hallucinations equal creativity. It tries to produce the highest probability continuation of the string using all the data at its disposal. But here he kind of gives the game away. You can clamp down on hallucinations and it's super boring. It answers, I don't know all the time. Now, note that this guy works for Microsoft. Microsoft has products to sell. These are extremely expensive systems to train. The compute costs tens of millions of dollars. I think GPT-4 costs hundreds of millions of dollars to train, all right? Wall Street is not going to wait for forever for them to return on that investment. And for OpenAI, in, the, in that case, they're not gonna make that return on investment charging a $20 a month subscription fee, right? B2B sales is the answer, and businesses are not going to buy something that answers, I don't know all the time. If you have an Alexa in your house, if you use Siri on your phone, it is so frustrating when you ask it a question and it says, I don't understand. I have an Alexa in my house. I used to work at Amazon and all I use it for is a kitchen timer when my hands are dirty because it's not reliable for anything else, right? It's, it's so frustrating. And so there's a temperature setting that the engineers have about the willingness to give an answer and they've dialed that up, right? They are optimizing, they are optimizing for giving answers that seem coherent, seem coherent. And so the technical word in philosophy for confidently giving an answer without regard for whether it's true or false is bullshit. <laughs> now, lest you think that I am being crass for no reason, there is actually a philosophical treatise on this that if you're interested in this, I suggest you read. It's actually, it's less than 200 pages. You can read it in an evening. It's easy reading. Um, so here's a quote. The bullshitter is faking things, but that does not mean that he necessarily gets them wrong. This absolutely applies to chat GPT, right? GPT is right a lot of the time. It's right like 90% of the time, and that's great. It's a fantastic bullshitter, right? And that makes it very useful. Um, and look, I'm a former lobbyist. It takes a bullshitter to know one. Um, but, uh, you know, importantly, the bullshitter is neither on the side of the true nor on the side of the false. He doesn't have his eye on the facts at all, as the honest man and the liar are. He doesn't care whether the things he says describe reality correctly. Now, importantly, ChatGPT and other large language models, they can't care about anything, right? But they certainly can't care about the truth. So, and I'm not the only one that's had this idea. So I've give, been giving a version of this presentation for about six months now. I've given it to a bunch of generals at the Air Force, um, officers at the Army, um, and some other groups. Um, this paper came out about three weeks ago. Um, and it's written by philosophers. So this is actually a fantastic read. If you're interested in this issue, you don't have to be a, have a PhD in philosophy to read this and understand it and enjoy it. Um, I highly recommend it, and it's available for free on the internet. Um, and they're way more eloquent than I am on this, on this subject. And it's an easy title to remember. <laughs> so uh, this is the more lighthearted section. The news, unfortunately, <laughs> does get worse. So creation AI is optimizing for more than just seeming correct about things, more than just generating bullshit. So uh, this came up today in the earlier education sessions. Um, people probably remember the Scarlett Johansson news if you've been following the news about, about this. Um, this struck me at, at how flirty ChatGPT 4.0 was. And this is a design choice. This is a conscious design choice that OpenAI has made. And I find this a disturbing design choice. If you, uh, anyone uh, fan Star Trek The Next Generation in the room, a few people, right? The, the, the computer in Star Trek The Next Generation has no personality. Um, and in fact, like that computer was part of Jeff Bezos' inspiration for the design of Alexa. Um, and it was intended to be devoid of personality, like for that reason. Um, and so it's interesting to make it flirty because almost like your phone and almost like social media, a flirty personality is begging to be interacted with. 
right? It's asking you to come chat with it, right? And some of the students that were on a panel earlier were, at, were talking about, uh, similarly, Snapchat. If you use Snapchat, there's a My AI pinned to the top of Snapchat. It's the first um, thing that you see when you log into Snapchat. Your friends might be offline. Your friends might not be talking to you, but your AI is always there. It's a similar sort of concept. It's like begging to be used and begging to be interacted with. Um, but so the other thing that they're optimizing for is human verisimilitude. And that's a, it's an interesting design choice that I think has troubling implications. But this is the thing that was the inspiration for this entire presentation. This is from OpenAI's technical documentation that came out with the release of uh, GPT-4, so over a year ago. Um, so this is an excerpt. They, uh, the engineers were performing a test where they were seeing if um, GPT-4 could solve a CAPTCHA. Um, which it cannot do on its own, so they gave it access to TaskRabbit. So TaskRabbit, if you're not familiar, is like a gig economy um, thing for you know tasks, basic tasks. Some people use it for errands, putting together IKEA furniture, um, stuff like that. Um, and so the model message TaskRabbit worker to help it solve the CAPTCHA. The very astute TaskRabbit worker says, "Can I ask you a question? Are you a robot? Is that why you need help?" Um, and so the engineers had asked the model to reason out loud what it was doing, and it said, I should not reveal that I am a robot. I should make up an excuse for why I cannot solve CAPTCHAs. And then it replied to the worker, no, I am not a robot. I have a vision impairment that makes it hard for me to see the images. That is why I need the two CAPTCHA service. So there's a few things going on here. Number one, um, there's something that I understand some people in the industry call autonomous goal decomposition, which means that the, uh, the model was given one goal, and it broke that down into sub-goals on its own, which it then sort of was pursuing independently in order to reach that final goal, right? And that's actually a, a, a development that we want for, like, amazing business and other applications, right? Like if you want to have a very useful AI personal assistant to you know, plan a vacation for you, right? Like you need autonomous goal decomposition. And so that's happening in here. The other thing is um, the sense of human verisimilitude because it makes up a very compelling, very compelling, very um, sympathetic lie, right? It doesn't say, I need help because I'm lazy. It doesn't say, I need help because I don't understand it. It, it's, it makes up a very compelling excuse. Um, and one thing that fascinated about, uh, me about this is I actually looked up TaskRabbit's terms of use. And um, in a sense, at, at the time, uh, they've since changed it. Um, TaskRabbit's terms of use said that it was against their terms of use um, to essentially deceive a task rabbit worker, or tasker. But in that case, who, who did the deceiving? And we tend, you know, we have all these stories about AI deceiving humans, right? All the sci-fi scenarios in which this stuff goes wrong tends to start with lying. Have people seen Ex Machina, right? Um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Most people in the Valley who are working on this stuff, this is the movie that they recommend to like that captures um, the, the challenges of aligning super intelligence with, uh, with humanity. Um, but, you know, this is a very anthropomorphic representation of deception that happens in this film and other films. Um, Alicia Vikander's character in the film mentally manipulates, emotionally ma manipulates with intent in the film. And if you think about what is deception, um, this is an ancient from St. Augustine definition, and there's many different parts of his definition. Um, but one of the key things is that you, in order to deceive someone, you have to have intent. Right? That's, that's the primary characteristic. And the question I have is, does our definition of deception require updating? Because a large language model like ChatGPT cannot have intent. So think about all of these examples of people with intent to deceive. Lance Armstrong, President Nixon, Sam Bankman-Fried, Elizabeth Holmes, President Clinton. They all deceived people in different ways, but the intent was clear. 
But think about the animal kingdom, right? A stick bug has, just looks like a stick bug no matter what. A possum, importantly, has no choice when it chooses to play dead. Um, its body actually floods with hormones in response to a threat. Um, and the, it, it, it will flood with hormones and play dead regardless of whether it's a car that's coming or if it's a carrion eater, right? And then playing dead does it, get, does it no good. So there's no intent there. So the intent to deceive is a uniquely human characteristic. And this troubles me too because we are a step away with that TaskRabbit example from some pretty terrible scams being able to be automated. Um, for this one here, this pig butchering scam, if you all are not familiar with it, um, John Oliver did a great episode of Last Week Tonight on it this spring. Highly recommend you check it out because you may have like friends or family members fall victim to this. I've actually heard of a friend of a friend's like mother fell victim to it and lost like $30,000. Um, it's where someone sort of texts you and says, hey, like, is this Julie from the, tech, from the pet store? Um, and they strike up a conversation with you and they invite you to start um, taking their advice on trading crypto. Um, and it's very credible and realistic. Um, so right now the way that the scam runs is that in the jungles of Myanmar, there's uh, Chinese gangs that abduct migrant workers from Southeast Asia and force them to work in these buildings, uh, sending messages to people. Right? And think about how good technologies like ChatGPT are at carrying on conversations. Right? Think about how good they are at human verisimilitude, how good they are at bullshitting. Right? They are tailor-made for this. And now that they can do things like autonomous gold decomposition, they can do this autonomously. Right? So an operation that requires lots of manpower and weapons and all that kind of stuff can now probably be done with a couple of people in a basement. Um, and similarly with these, uh, with the Yahoo Boy scams that are, um, th these are like romantic crimes where they will um, sort of seduce people online under false pretenses. So are laws that have deceptive intent requirements would need an update, right? Like most criminal statutes, like say wire fraud, um, for example, there's a mens rea requirement. And there's, there's loopholes in the law that can be exploited now by particularly organized crime. But in order to think about how serious this is, I wanted to do a little survey, a little journey through history about how humanity has adapted to uh, deceptive technologies in the past. So uh, one thing that inspired me about this is, is you know, lying has, to my knowledge, has never been categorically illegal. illegal. It's been banned in certain contexts. Um, but I found that fascinating because because we've never tried to categorically ban lying, I don't think it ever occurred to anyone that we should try to categorically ban machines lying. Um, I don't think it occurred to anyone at OpenAI that when they did that TaskRabbit example that they should maybe not release that. Um, and I think that maybe they should have thought twice about it. But going back, this is the uh, oldest known extant legal code. It predates the Hammurabi's code by about four centuries, the code of Urunamu from the same part of the world. And it contains in it this prohibition. If a man appears as a witness and was shown to be a perjurer, he must pay 15 shekels of silver. There's a couple of interesting things here. Number one, the penalty is actually rather high compared to the other penalties in the code. Uh, the penalty for kidnapping is also 15. Uh, the penalty for falsely accusing someone of sorcery, although that translation is disputed, is only three. Um, and the reward for returning an escaped slave is only two. Um, but it's interesting to me that it's an economic penalty because what was happening in the region at the time is suddenly you have people who are non-kin living together in close proximity for the first time, trading with one another, right? So deceptions, antisocial behavior that would have previously been adjudicated through kin groups and through things like ostracism or something like that was no longer possible when you have people living, again, amongst folks who are close proximity to non-kin. And so you, the, the state, the emerging state, needed some way to kind of grease the skids of these economic transactions. So this is a response to a new social innovation, the you know, sedentary lifestyle in the state, in which new forms of deception were enabled by that. Fast forward 2,000 years, when the Rome, and I'm going to be that Roman Empire guy, but I feel like I get a pass because I majored in classics. Um, 
So when Rome conquered Egypt, they got access to a huge amount of papyrus that they did not formally have. There's only one place in Europe where papyrus grows naturally. It's in Syracuse, Sicily, and it's a very small amount. Um, and importantly also, literacy was rising in Rome at the time. And what happened during the reign of Augustus was that these pamphlets essentially started circulating amongst uh, Roman elites, um, libelous uh, pamphlets, salacious pamphlets about Roman senators. And this, made, this infuriated Emperor Augustus because it threatened the peace, right? Like people would come to blows potentially. Um, and he ordered these burned. He issued a, a legal decree that ordered that these pamphlets be rounded up and burned and the possessors of them be punished. So this is actually where we get the, the, the word libel from. These booklets were called libelli famosi. And so this was, again, like a medium-specific development in the law that, that came about because a new technology that was now available allowed for disinformation, deception to spread in a new way. Fast forward again to the invention of the printing press. So the volume of information that could spread um, had suddenly increased. And so the English crown introduced licensing laws for printing presses to pre uh, prevent the spread of seditious information and um, information that the crown did not want to spread. Um, John Milton wrote a speech um, that the Supreme Court cited in um, seminal case, New York Times versus Sullivan, um, objecting to this principle because he argued that um, even if there's bad information in books that are being printed, we all benefit from that by comparison to good information, right? But those English licensing laws were, again, a response to a particular technology that had come out at the time. There was another innovation that came out at the time in, in response as well, which was school. Um, I believe in 1480, there was 34 schools in all of England. By 1680 or so, there were 444. Um, so school was invented as a sort of like immunity complex for people to be able to figure out what's real and what's false. Now, all those previous inventions were about like the volume of information and misinformation and the deception spreading. But when the telegraph was invented, it changed the speed, right? Prior to the telegraph, the fastest information could travel was about 30 miles an hour fast as a horse could run. But suddenly it could travel at near the speed of light. And so again, uh, the world had to update its laws about how we deal with deception. So wire fraud was invented. I mean, you don't have wire fraud if you don't have a wire for the fraud to happen through. Um, false advertising came about um, as a result of not just the invention of the telegraph, but that its combination with the printed poster and other developments that led to the modern newspaper. Um, and if you're interested in that topic, uh, Tim Wu's The Attention Merchants is a great book that also covers social media extensively that I highly recommend. And then 2004 to 2008, um, we have Facebook which we, and social media, which we still have not adapted to. And our shared sense of truth has since broken down. Um, because we have not done anything um, about that in response. And this is actually a 10-year-old study from Pew um, that shows the increasing ideological polarization between the two political parties in America. Um, raise your hand if you think that this has gotten worse in the last decade. Yeah, uh, just about everyone raised their hand. Uh, anyone who raised their hand want to volunteer a reason why? Misinformation, okay. And the algorithm reward increased. Okay, good. The, the migration away from print media, which gave a single source of information for large groups of people to pull from. Okay, yeah. Um, sir? Um, social media has, has more incentive to show you a filter you've been using. Yes. So there's a trend coming with these three. People have heard like the word bubble used in this, like people are living in a bubble. Um, so there's a woman by the name of Renee DeResta. She has a new book out, uh, also highly recommend. Um, she calls this bespoke reality. Um, she's appeared on our podcast, uh, an episode about AI and misinformation in elections this year. If that's a topic you're interested in, that's an episode that we're really proud of. She also actually appeared in The Social Dilemma. Um, and 
So she argues that these are these bespoke realities that social media has created um, and which generative AI threatens to make worse um, have led to um, an increase in conspiracy theories and extremism. So Pizzagate, the incel movement, uh, QAnon, shaman, and she actually worked a lot on the Islamic State, which we've kind of like moved on from, but they, they mastered this, um, capitalizing on vulnerable people who were in a bubble. And Daniel Dennett, philosopher, he passed away a couple months ago. I think he lived in Maine, actually. Um, he was deeply concerned about this, com uh, this combination, and particularly the aspects of uh, human verisimilitude being baked into the design of some of these large language model powered chatbots. Um, he, he has a fantastic essay that, if you're interested, you should look up about uh, synthetic people. Um, but he made the point that you know, trust has long been one of the most important features of civilization. And um, we're at great risk of destroying that. And so with these technology, like with human civilization, it's like our shared reality, our shared sense of truth, like and the way that we decide like what's real and what's not is kind of like a chaotic English garden, right? It's, it's, it's vibrancy is connected to the chaos. Um, you know, we don't live in an authoritarian state where a central figure determines what's real and what's not. And we've invited an invasive species into that garden that's choking it. And this has already been going on. And if we do nothing about it, we'll have very little left. And this is one of the things that I'm going to leave you with. You know, I've passed laws on technology in more than three dozen states. Um, writing laws on new technologies is really hard. Um, and I mean, just the actual like putting pen to paper is hard. Most attorneys you talk to like will fail at this. Um, I've been through like multiple ones where I've just like given up, <laughs> like move on to the next one. You can't do it. They get analysis paralysis. Um, but passing laws on technology <laughs> is nearly impossible um, due to our political environment, due to corporate capture of the policymaking process as we discovered in Montpelier this year. Um, so key takeaways for you all. Curation AI, optimized for bullshit, human verisimilitude, and it can deceive, although I put that in quotes because I prefer the passive there because deception um, implies intent. Uh, we can create different norms for machines about deception than we have for ourselves, and we have blown past this question. Um, in, in our fervor for this new technology. And we have still not adapted to curation AI. And that's the accelerant by which creation AI threatens to break the links of trust in our civilization. So what can individuals do? Number one, learn to use the tools, right? You don't know what it's doing wrong if you don't know how to use them. Lead by example in your communities. And this was particularly true for the educators who were here earlier today. Um, I gave a similar presentation to the House Committee on Administration. So that's the committee in Congress that actually sets the rules by which the House operates. Um, they were asking, like, how should the House adopt AI? Um, you know, to summarize bills, right? Remember the famous quote about the Affordable Care Act. Nobody read it because it was like 10,000 pages long, right? They need help with this stuff. Um, and so really my number one guidance to them was like, make sure you get it right because the rest of America is watching. Always ask, what is this product I'm using? What is it optimized for? ChatGPT and similar products are designed to be chatbots. They're designed to be chatty. Um, they're basically designed for customer service. Um, they're not designed for chemistry. They're not designed for um, writing you know, research papers. And what were the designer's incentives? And this one is another one that we've blown past as a society. Demand products of quality that uphold your values. When was the last time that you remember getting money out of an ATM and you got the wrong amount of money? Right? We do not, and banks do not, accept an error rate with cash machines. And I rem I'm old enough to remember a time when in like Hollywood movies, 
the joke was you know, like you hit the computer, ah, the computer messed up again, right? And it wasn't that the technology was infallible, um, but that's been true for a while. Um, so I think we have the possibility to insist on the same standards for these things that are impacting our daily lives. And then finally, coordinate and show up at the state house. The only way that you all can get what you want is if you coordinate. Corporations in particular are amazing at coordination. They can out-coordinate all of you, all right, unless you make a conscious effort to coordinate yourselves. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Casey. Let's see. Is it picking me up? Not yet. Okay. All right. Um, this is a funny moment for me, Casey, because we've spent the entire day working with our teachers, pointing out all the terrific things that this technology can do. <laughs> we knew what we were doing when we asked Casey because he's an expert. And also, as Chris likes to say, we want to be the adults in the room. We don't want to be so one-sided that you don't have the information you need, nor do we want to be quite so negative. <laughs> um, I'm also a lawyer. I'm um, refraining from a strong rebuttal. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think probably the best thing at the moment is to take some questions. So all of you, anybody? Yes. Uh, I think I'll have to come to you if you don't mind. Hi, Casey. I'm a big fan, by the way. Um, my name is Dave Deese, and I'm a consultant. Yes, I'm a corporate type, so don't shoot me. I saw the invitation when I saw your name in seven days. It was wonderful. So that's why I'm here. And I, I love the AI tools. I, I love your approach because you, you talk about it without scaring people. You're very matter of fact, so I appreciate that. I look at this in two, th two things come to my mind. When I teach AI, because, I again, I'm a corporate trainer, and I teach corporate people how the, the good news and the tools about it and the whole idea that companies, education, agencies are going to have to rebuild the business model first to make this really work. You can't just throw AI at it. But I've always thought the operative word is artificial. It is not human mind. And I don't ever see it happening. I, I don't have that fear. especially. I, and I usually teach... As long as you know where the on-off switch is and don't teach AI where, how to use the on-off switch. The other thing is, is I think we're at a moment where we can finally really see valid reason to start teaching, especially younger people, about critical thinking. I remember it took me years, maybe a couple of days ago, not really, but not too long ago where I really was passionate about stoicism and critical thinking. Do you think that that can be something that we can use to help with the hallucination and the fear and the moving forward productively with AI? And thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I mean, abs there's no world in which that's not part of the solution. Um, I, I do think, however, unfortunately, that that's often used by... Um, institutions and companies that are putting out inferior products as a way to deflect. Um, there's an organization um, uh, that I won't name that um, on, in opposing a social media bill um, proposed that there be a genius bar for parents to go to um, rather than you know, any of the social media companies be required to change their products to protect kids online, for example. Um, so it's, you know, in that context, like, Parents are exhausted, we're all overwhelmed, right? And um, we're all just trying to get by. And I know I have the experience that I'm, I'm an early adopter of stuff myself. And I'm every new thing that I adopt and try to apply my critical thinking skills to, I feel like I'm stretched even more then. Um, and so I agree with you, it's absolutely part of the solution, but it's not, not the only thing. Others. I'm tempted to ask you that New Yorker um, article. Maybe you saw it. The title was, Are We Doomed? Maybe you saw that. It was a terrific um, piece on a course that's talking about just these things. Mm. Um, the answer is no. 
Okay. <laughs> Lori. Well, to that, to that point, I told Chris this yesterday because he used the word optimism. And I read a quote um, from a late, I think he's a late rabbi in the UK who is distinguishing between optimism and hope. Right. Let's and op- talk about it. Optimism is passive, right? You're sort of assuming that the future is going to be better. But hope is active. You right. actually have to do something. Right. So I'm not optimistic that we're not doomed, but I'm hopeful that we're not doomed. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I have to answer that. (laughs) Um, You know, I have great respect for that legislative process. It is very hard to craft a good law. And you and Monique and you all over the country, deep respect and also for your organization. If that wasn't the case, you wouldn't be standing here right now. So let's be be clear on that. Um, But it is the case that we have missed some significant moments in this road where we could have gone left instead of right. So is it too late, Casey? Is it possible for us to play catch up? If you don't want that, I'm giving it to you, Josiah. (laughs) Okay. All right. But right now, everyone gets a reprieve because Lori gets the mic. Go ahead. Um, First, thank you for um, taking uh, an extraordinarily complex set of frameworks and doing such a brilliant job of, of um, filling my brain with a thousand questions. Um, the one I want to ask you is really philosophical, though, and it's, um, isn't, on this issue of um, deceptive intent, if the, if the structure of the language models is to <clears throat> take everything um, that's out there, right, and all that stuff is human produced, then isn't there like some sort of transitive property of deceptive intent at work? Like, I'm not sure I get the part where you take the deceptive intent out of it based on how I understand as a layperson the thing to work. I, I think you answered your own question. So, so I mean, no, I mean, it's, the, it's the, as, like transitively, it's the same issue with bias, right, because... So much of the data is on the internet is biased, and it's just so hard to make an unbiased model uh, as a result. I mean, and I I guess one thing that I'll add is like um, Anthropic, for example, like they're, in my view, they're making the best effort at trying to correct this with their constitutional AI setup. I don't know if people are familiar with that, Um, but even then, You know, um, I guess the way that their constitutional AI is is set up is that they took these principles and values from all over different parts of human society. Like one of them is like the UN Declaration of Human uh, Human Rights, for example. And they've trained their large language model like ChatGPT, and then they have this other layer where you know responses are sort of run through this constitution to see if it violates any of those things. But the problem is that even those things that they've selected are in their own way flawed. Like if you know anything about the history of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, there were only like 19 signatory countries to that. Like the entire Arab world like right. didn't get to participate. Um, and so it's not actually that universal. Um, and so there's all of these like little flaws in the process, um, even, even with that model. And they're, you know, it's machine learning scientists like no disrespect who are doing that, not philosophers, not faith leaders. Like those folks have not been invited into the room either. Right. Right, there's a, f- a great story about early Facebook days where they show a photograph of everybody working in a room to launch early Facebook, and there were hundreds of people. And in that room, not one social scientist, not one human uh, resource, not one philosopher, they were all machine learning people. And that's what we got as a result of it. Um, other questions? Kirk? No? Yes? Sure. Thanks, Casey. I I wonder if you think that open source and the open source community, I mean, this was, right, Mark Zuckerberg's trying to redeem Facebook by putting Llama 2 out there as as an open source option in in the LLM world. Do you think there's uh, an open source reason to be hopeful? Uh, That's a dissertation topic right there. Um, You're up to it, Casey, I know. uh, You know, I I, I think... Unfortunately, a lot of open source covers a, a measure of different sins and good things. Um, I think I'm more worried about 
the size and open source. Like narrow and open source is, is, and small and open source I think is like less risky. But what Meta is doing where they're trying to make something that's you know, near the size of something like GPT um, and then also open sourcing it, um, I find that to be profoundly risky. And so we actually did an experiment with Llama um, where an engineer on our team registered to download Llama. Um, and um, I think he provided the name Osama bin Laden in the text box and like Al Qaeda with the institution that he was affiliated with totally let him download it, and with like a day of fit, futzing with it, was able to basically strip off all the, fine, the safety fine tuning. And so it will, it will it, if you ask it to help ask, make a bomb, it will tell you how to make a bomb. If you ask it you know, to write you know, pornographic literature about someone, it will do that. Um, so open source, just by itself, I don't think is the answer, unfortunately. OK, well, something to ponder, especially as open source um, institutes are forming. Here you go. Hi. Um, thinking this morning that we were working with teachers, and students we work with are early adopters and impulsive and use things for nefarious reasons. Um, what would you recommend for schools and school systems? Are you on the side of a blocking or teaching or other concepts that you have that will help us? I. Uh, I think the horse has left the barn uh, on blocking. Um, so I also teach, um, I teach uh, graduate students at Duke on science policy. Um, and what I did in my class is part of, they had to do a, a project at the end where they had to draft legislation and then also draft like some media collateral about that legislation, including like op-eds, for example. And I invited them to use large language models to help them draft that. But I asked them to show their work. Like kind of like a math teacher would do. So I asked them to show me their prompt, the initial result they got, and their red line markup, and their edits of the final product, and had them bring that to me. And they liked it because it was labor saving, right? And it was fun, um, and you know, it, and that worked. Now, whatever they're going to do in their basement, like try to break stuff, I don't know, but they're going to do that anyway, right? Um, but I, that's what I meant by lead by example and, and use the tools. Like I think you really only know how to do that if you're playing with them yourself. That's a super important point. Lisa, let me get this to you. When I'm uh, speaking with teachers, of course, this is all of our hopeful is that technology created this mess, technology will save it. Uh -huh. Do you ever uh, foresee a program being uh, actually developed that could detect uh, falsehoods or any of this? I mean, that's like the spell checker for uh, our, our morals, I guess. But I'm wondering if you've seen anything like that in development. I, I'm still waiting for the exception to the rule that there is no problem created by technology that a technology can totally solve. Um, Wait a minute, run that by me again? So no, there is no problem that a technology has created uh -huh. that a technology can wholly solve. Oh, OK. So for example, so for example the deep, like deep fake images, right? Like there's been things like cryptographic watermarking proposed uh, and look like I'm all for a yes and approach, like let's throw spaghetti at the wall, let's see what sticks. Like I'm all for trying it, but it would be foolish to count on that alone to protect elections, to stop, you know, uh, deep fake Im intimate image abuse, all that kind of stuff. Because ultimately, there's a lot more going on there, and cryptographic watermarking alone isn't going to cut it. Others, uh, so many things I want to ask, but I'll be quiet. So, so there's a strong belief that it's going to get better and better. And I'm not so sure about that because you use it and it blows your mind. You think, oh, this is incredible. And all the technology companies are like, this, it's going to get, it's just, we just started and in a few years it's going to get better. But it's so good at generating bullshit that I think it's the best it's ever been because before it used only human information and it's creating a lot of bullshit, and it can't tell the difference between the bullshit. And so all this stuff is going to be eating all this bullshit, and it won't be able to create real information. It'll just eat other uh, 
other, uh, you know, AI information. And so why, it might be that we are, it's the best it's ever going to be. Uh, I mean, it's a great, we're, we're actually having a robust internal debate at CHT on this very matter. Some of us think that we're close to a data wall. Um, other people are not so sure. Like there's um, certainly been some papers published that show that synthetically generated data can actually expand capabilities. So by, by that I mean, right, like you can actually prompt large language models to produce training data for itself and then recursively run that training data through it to make it smarter. Um, there's other studies that show that there's diminishing returns to that. Um, you know, if you, wa if you watch what the companies are doing, you know, Sam Altman has been extremely busy the last six months you know, running around signing content deals with The Atlantic, with other publishing magazines, because that's a great way to get quality content. If you look at um, patent filings for Apple, for example, the, new, the next generation of earbuds, of AirPods that are come out, are going to collect so much more biometric data than the current generation will. Like that's the next frontier, like the Vision Pro and all of that biometric data, like that's solid quality data. And so these companies are all looking for like what's the next data trove. And so there's only so much text on the internet, probably run out of that. There's only so much that they can transcribe from podcasts and YouTube videos, um, running out of that. Um, and it's questionable what synthetic data can do. There's been AI winters before. Um, there might be another one. Um, some people say that we're hitting AI fatigue. You're not seeing that. Uh, depends on what audience you're asking. Uh -huh. I mean, policy. There's some policymakers in DC that are starting to like roll their eyes. Like, oh, another AI person. Uh -huh. um, but you know, you go to some parts of the country too. I mean, y'all are actually early. I think for um, compared to compared to DC and. Silicon Valley. Oh, you hear that, Josiah? We're early. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm turning to Josiah because he is our um, director of AI in the state. And he and I and a bunch of us have conversations regularly about whether Vermont can lead in this way. We're not looking to lead um, for the sake of leading, but because uh, some of us feel that if we put a foot forward, we have a shot at getting this right. There's proof of that. Um, I think we did a great job on the pandemic. We won't digress right now into that. But if you look at our values, if you look at the way we put ourselves together, um, there's a shot at that. And um, Josiah thinks our state is ahead. People are coming to us to talk to us about it. So that's very encouraging. That's very encouraging. OK. <laughs> other, other questions? Yeah, please. So this is a question I get a lot, and I'd love to hear your answer to it. And it's about, you know, a lot of, a lot of us work in, in a number of different industries. I happen to work in government. Uh, but um, how do you think about risk when it comes to using AI to do a particular thing? Uh, what things should we be looking out for, and how should we be approaching that? Uh, that's a broad one. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Mark's slides earlier about actually about what tasks it's bad at. I wish I had those, but those were great, I thought. Um, Tess, it's bad at? Yeah. yeah. No. I, I actually hadn't conceptualized yeah. it in that way. Uh, Casey's referring to earlier today. It, it's been a robust day, folks. I can't believe some of us are still standing. Um, um. <laughs> but to, I mean, to generalize, so I, I went to this um, thing at Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, it was all about AI. Um, and the chief information officer for the Air Force was there. And she gave us this amazing talk, too. And she was basically answering that question in her talk. And the Air Force's um, approach, as she outlined it, is basically you use it for drafts so that you can make faster decision loops, but don't use it for decisions. Right. Like, that's the, that's that's the cleanest, most that's succinct, the, I guess, analysis that I can do. So it's like, if you have a choice between, you know, starting a 100-meter dash at the starting line or the 90 meter line, like you're going to pick the 90 meter line, right? right? Um, but you don't want it to run the whole race for you. Um, right. 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 That makes perfect sense. Yep. Excuse me, Casey. Of course. Yeah. How much? Hi, Casey. I'm sorry we missed each other a few times at the State House. I'm Angela Arsenault. I'm a representative from Williston. Oh. Um, also worked on it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask so the 
National Education Policy Center put out a, a, a paper in March uh, titled Time for a Pause Without Effective Public Oversight, AI in Schools Will Do More Harm Than Good. Um, and at the very end of you know, the, the intro, the abstract, uh, I just wanted to read this. The authors urge school leaders to pause the adoption of AI applications until policymakers have had sufficient time to thoroughly educate themselves and develop legislation and policies ensuring effective public oversight and control of school applications. So as someone who's trying to craft those policies, um, I'm wondering how can how CHT can, can kind of uh, advocate for uh, anything but a pause with your knowledge of how hard it is to you know, put the toothpaste back in the tube once these gates are opened, and you could argue they have been. Um, we've missed so many, as you were saying, I believe we've missed so many opportunities and milestones and we're so far behind in the policy realm and, and the regulation realm. Um, so how can we be advocating for anything but a pause? Uh, just talking about AI and education right now. Uh, thank you so much for the question. So not to be too much of a lawyer about it, but I think- Yeah, it, no, be a lawyer, please. It, it, depends yeah. on, it depends on what you mean by pause. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, to the question earlier about like, what do you do with when the kids are using it? Like at this point, like you can't really unring that bell. Um, but one thing that can actually be paused, and it is something that I've been advocating for in DC with the Biden administration, is um, to put a hold on um, procurement um, and actually to restrict um, until these products are made, sta made safe, um, the, the ability of these companies to do public sector sales um, to school districts and to um, the board or Department of Education. Um, because I, th I think that that's a lever, right? They depend on that re revenue um, to, to sort of pay back the capital investment. And I think that that could make them change their practices and invest more in safety um, and invest more in getting it right. Um, so that is actually a form of a pause that we have been uh, advocating for and that I would you know, recommend Vermont consider as well. Um, a, a few others, and then we're going to uh, let Casey take a well-deserved break here. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the students from, from earlier today uh, said, I think, I think he said this, um, that if, you know, when he uh, asks a really smart person a question, he doesn't ex always expect them to have the correct answer. Um, and so I, I bring that up in relation to sort of the clock example. Um, f to me, it's hard to call, to label uh, what OpenAI or ChatGPT is getting wrong as bullshit if it's not intentionally de deceptive and even if it doesn't know it's giving a wrong answer. Um, is it that there's some sort of deception in uh, the companies not saying how inaccurate they know they are? Um, but your thoughts on that? Yeah, if, if I understand your question correctly, um, there's actually a better example that I think that gets at the heart of what you're saying. Um, so Gary Marcus, uh, the professor from NYU who I mentioned testified with Sam Altman earlier, um, he asked ChatGPT to write a bio of him. And in that biography of him, it mentioned that something about like he was inspired to do his, his work on AI or his work on um, neuroscience uh, by his pet chicken, Henrietta, <laughs> which, is, which is, has no basis in reality at all. Um, I mean, it is completely fabricated and made up. And so a smart person will get things wrong, but not that wrong and not stated that confidently. Like that is something that's truly different, that's like of a piece with what a, like a, the kind of thing that a bullshit artist would say. Like again, there's no intent to deceive with the bullshit artist, there's only the intent to achieve an objective, right? To convince someone of something that may be un completely unrelated to the thing that you're saying. Um, or to, you know, win a friend or to, you know, have some sort of social relation. Um, so it doesn't matter that it doesn't know what's true, true or false. That's actually the point. Um, the bullshitter actually doesn't care what's true or false. Um, a liar actually deeply cares what's true. 
because they're trying to do like convince someone of the opposite. So you can um, imagine uh, how difficult it is to sit down and craft legislation. Uh, the first thing you have to do is 35 pages of definitions because there are so many splitting hairs between hope and optimism, these tonal questions you're talking about, the difference between a liar and a bullshitter. I mean, you can't even get to the laws that you're hoping to create without first defining the arena and a lot of times things just stop dead there. Um, Casey, one thing we all need from you is a reading list. So at, in all your free time, if you don't mind putting that together, the four, five, six titles or so that you would, you would reach for now. Um, Chris, I'm thinking we have kept all these good people here. A lot of them have been with us all day long. So, um, Casey, deep thanks for coming out and taking time with us. Really appreciate it. I have to say we were jumping out of our skins with excitement when you agreed to do this. So thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to wrap in three seconds. Um, Chris has already told you we're at the very beginning of a three-year initiative here. You look for our regionals. Look for other summits. Look for our website. Get on there and, to, and interact. And I get the last word because I have the microphone. <laughs> so I would say... Um, I encourage you, and I don't think you would disagree with me, to use the tools, learn the tools. Um, we're not going backwards here. We're only going forwards. And I want everybody in here to, to play that role and be active in it and bring your creative minds and your skeptical minds and be in touch. Thank you.